Hello everybody, welcome to this online service coming to you from Hermanus in the Western Cape of South Africa. We are 12, 13 days short of Christmas and one senses the anticipation beginning to build. I'm delighted to uh, share part of today's service with uh, Angelina Beinecke. Angelina, it's great to have you. Um, where do you go to school? Um, in Harmonis High School. Okay, grade what? Grade 9. Grade 9. Yes. And uh, you're shortly off on holiday. Uh, heading where? Uh, I'm going to Plettenberg Bay for three uh, weeks. With the family? Yes. Great. Well, I hope you have a, a super time. Thank, Thank you for you. coming along to be part of this service. Music always plays an important role at Christmas time and uh, ever since our youngest days we have been singing Christmas carols. We probably know a goodly number of them off by heart. Well if you read the Christmas narratives there is singing. You remember Mary's Magnificat after Gabriel had come to her and told her that she was to be with child. We have that wonderful hymn that she sings to her Lord. And then also the shepherds watching their flocks out in the field. And uh, suddenly we read the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were, as the Bible says, sore afraid. Suddenly with the multitude, there they, they were, they were angels singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace uh, on earth uh, with men and women with whom God is pleased. So appropriately, we're going to start with a great carol and we're going to be joining the vast congregation at Westminster Abbey. Now this is High Anglican, so it's a little bit different to the way we do things at the United Church, but it is a wonderful act of worship as the congregation sings, O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem.
Wasn't that thrilling, O come all you faithful? We are going to pray now, so let us turn our hearts towards God as we speak to him. Loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of gathering in this way. Christians scattered around the world, but all one in Christ Jesus, whose birth we remember at this Christmas time. We thank you for the great gospel story of how you so loved this world that you gave your only Son that anyone who believes and trusts in him should not live a fruitless, unfulfilled life, but should share in your life itself. We thank you for the deep, deep and rich significance of Christmas. And we pray that you will fill our hearts again with the good news of Jesus. We pray that amidst all the comings and goings, amidst all the preparations, we will find time to be still and to go deeper and to remember that we are loved by you and that you call us in turn to love others. And we thank you for this Christmas season. May it be a time of deep fellowship with you. Hear us as we share together in the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever.
Our Bible reading is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and on his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who has said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me in according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Thanks be to do you remember the movie of round about 1965, The Greatest Story Ever Told? I think it was directed by George Stevens. And it was the story of, of, of Jesus of Nazareth, um, beginning at his nativity. In other words, the events that we recall at Christmas time. Uh, I've always enjoyed that titled The Greatest Story Ever Told. Uh, it's an, uh, an appropriate summation of, of the wonderful story of John 3.16, For God so loved the world, and the coming of, of Jesus as the Saviour of the, of the world um, to do what he, he did do. Um, but the story doesn't just begin on Christmas. Uh, the, 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 the greatest story ever told actually has its antecedents, its, its prior history in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. You know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was, uh, was void, and, and the Spirit of God was hovering on, on the waters. Um, uh, you, you remember what happens in, in Genesis. God resolves to make this world. And it is, a, it, is a, it is a story of a love relationship between our creator God who loved this world, who brings this world into being, brings man to, into being, brings man and woman together. In, in the hope that here was someone in, with whom he could share himself uh, upon people who, upon whom he could shower his, his love and, and blessing. And then the rebellion of, of Adam and Eve and how things unraveled from there and God trying to woo them back because... Uh, he loved them, and and it was a it was a it was a real challenge for him to see the people whom he loved, his sons and daughters, turning their back on him. And you've got the early chapters of of Genesis, which reflect a a story of rebellion. And 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 so the story goes that God then decides that he he wants a special people. In this world and so he calls him a man and that man is Abraham and, and Abraham is going to be the father of a, 
of a great nation, the Jews. And they are to be a blessing to the world, or the nations will come to, to Jerusalem and, and declare that the God of Israel truly is the, the one true living God. It's, the story is, is being told of, of God's pursuit, of God's desire for oneness in this world, God's love for his people. For, for restoration of this world that has rebelled against him. Uh, but far from creating a, a people who will love him and serve him and reflect that love in the world, even then his chosen people rebel. And, and God sends prophets who plead and beg with, with the people of God and yeah, there are many who are true and faithful, but it would seem as if most just put their fingers in their ears and just did their own thing. Um, but God's is a love that would never let us go. And, and he could not wash his hands of this world. It's a, a passionate story of God's longing for fellowship with us his people, and man's refusal to acknowledge him for who he is. So, so this is what goes on before um, the, the great story really begins in earnest. It's the story of the, of the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible, God's longing, or God's passion for fellowship, to create a people whom he who would be his instruments for healing and wholeness in the world. Um, and, then, and then the whole story kind of like narrows, narrows down, narrows down, narrows down. And according to our reading of the Bible, God purposes now to, to send someone, someone so, so special, so deep, so intimate to himself, uh, in a way, though it may seem unusual to say it, it's all that he has, his one and beloved son. And God resolves in order to bring this world back to himself, you and me, because he loves the world so much that he sent his only son. But he can't just send his son from eternity into the world, sort of, kind of willy-nilly. He suddenly appears from nowhere. He is going to bring his son through a very human means. He's going to bring his son through a woman. And that woman is Mary. And so try and picture this. It's, it's almost like a Google map. You've done Google Maps where you see the world. You know, the map begins from way out of space. And, and, and the, the, you, you, you press in closer with your, with your cursor and you come closer, 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 closer. And so... God's love for the world and his desire to see this world brought back to himself because he wants to bless the world for goodness sake. He wants to heal the world. But is he going to be the divine magician working from afar? No. He is going to be God himself working within the world, within the structures of humanity. So he sends his own son. And so the Google map kind of viewing it from afar comes close, close, down, 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 you know, down, down, down. I mean, I viewed this house that I live in, 17 McFarland Street, Eastcliff, uh, from the Google perspective. I, I, I start in outer space and I come down, 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 down. I've got Africa in my, in, on my screen and I come down, down, down. Then I have South Africa down, 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 and I have the Western Cape, 
and I come down here to the southeastern coast, and then I've got sort of Cape Agulhas danger point in my, on my screen. I come down, 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 and then I've got Eastcliff in my, on my screen, and then I've got McFarland Street on my screen, and then I've got number 17, and there it is. There's my home. God so loved the world. That's the kind of view from afar, and down, down, down comes the camera. Down, 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 down to, to the Middle East. Down, 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 down to, to Palestine. Down, 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 down to Nazareth. Down, down, down to a little house. Down, 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 and in that house is a young girl. She's probably about 14 to 17 years of age. God says to Gabriel, go to her and tell her that she is the one that I have chosen to bear my own son, to bring my own son, to kind of carry my own son, my Jesus, into this world. Now you try and view the story from, from Mary's point of view, we kind of like heard it from God's point of view. I want to save this world, but I need to use somebody. I need a young woman. So now we look at it from Mary's point of view. She's minding her own business, and suddenly before her, Gabriel appears, and she's taken aback. And then Gabriel tells her the story of how she has been chosen by God and that she is going to be with child and it's going to be a boy and this is going to be the son of the Most High. Now you can understand that she's taken aback. She'd probably say, excuse me, what are you talking about? Do you know who, you, who I am? I'm just a, a humble, humble woman somewhere between the age of whatever it is. I mean, say she's 16. May have even been younger, may even have been so. But she's been chosen, chosen. Can you imagine what her reaction must have been? What, what thoughts are going through her mind? She doesn't understand all this. Yes, she has some sort of inkling. God is, the Gabriel has said, you know, she's, she, this child is, is going to be the son of the Most High God, and he's going to take on the throne of David, which is an everlasting throne, and his name is going to be Jesus. And now that's where George Stevens' film, The Greatest Story Ever Told, begins. But it has that whole build-up. But imagine Mary. Like, are you serious? What are you talking about? I'm not worthy. This is too much for me. What will my Verlufter, that man that I'm engaged in, his name is Joseph, what will, what will he say? What will he be thinking? Can you imagine the disgrace that might befall me in, in people's eyes? Because, you know, people skin it. They, they talk. Wada, wada, wada. You know how people are. Um, it was a huge moment in Mary's own life, and it was a huge moment in the history of humanity. In, in that little home in Nazareth, and Google Maps has come right down. One young woman having to make this momentous decision. Will she play a part in God's story or will she say, no, it's too much for me. I will just get on and live my life here in Nazareth and grow old and have my own children in due course, but none of this big story. And there unfolds the greatest story ever told. Because you remember, she says, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. 
and then having had an opportunity to think about it, she says, we read in verse 38, here am I, here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. And then we are told the angel who is Gabriel departed from her. Yeah, mission accomplished. I've got a child. I've got a daughter. I've got a woman who is willing, willing to take on this role of being the one who we might say is the bearer of the Son of God, the God-bearer. Now in the early church, not in the book of Acts, but a few years after the Bible had been written, they called her the Theotokos, the, the God-bearer, the one who was to bring the Son of God into the world. It's beautiful. It really, really is beautiful. And I've thought about that in these days of Christmas, with Christmas just around the corner. As I said, she could have said no. Just let me live my life. Just let me live my life and in due course I will die and vanish from this world. But she understood herself as being part of a bigger story. Now let me say that again. Mary understood herself as being part of a larger and a bigger story. So it wasn't just about I and me and mine. She opened herself up and allowed God to use her for the purposes for which he had for this world. And this essentially is my message to you today. Mary's willingness to take on that role. And she will forever be called blessed. But what about you and me? Will you allow God at this Christ Christmas time to use you in a larger story other than just the story of your own life? Will you allow God to take you and use you? You know, life is very short. Growing up, I remember words of a man who played cricket for England. He died in around about 1931, and I don't remember the years that he played cricket for England. His name was C.T. Studd. And he wrote this, Only one life, and it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now, when I was young, I thought, oh, I've got many, many years. You know, many years ahead of me. And... Uh, Somewhere at some point, you know, I'll connect with God's purpose for my life. But I was always, there was too much living to be done. So now I'm 68. And I think, really? Where have the years gone? What have I accomplished in my life? It's a question I think we all ask. And it's at that point where we begin to say, where does my story fit in? To the larger story that God is telling. I want my life to be used for something more than just my parochial concerns. I want my life to have a meaning beyond that self which one day will die. I want to leave and to bequeath to this world something something that is good, something that is godly, something that God feels. That is my son. And I want to achieve something because of the years that I gave to him. Your life is not an accident, friends. 
It's not. You know, some people say the world came into this, at least the world was begun or began as an accident. One day it will end as an accident. It's all accidental. And quite honestly, I don't think you nor I want to live an accidental life. We want to see our lives fitting in to something that God wants to do through you and through me. And I look at Mary and I hear her saying, I want my life to count for something. And she says, here I am. I am the Lord's servant. I want my life to have a significance that is pleasing to God himself. I don't want ever anybody at my funeral to sing that song, I did it my way, which is what often happens. Please, can we sing Sinatra's, I did it my way? I want it to be the testimony of my life, as I'm sure you want it to be the testimony of your life. That for all the stumblings and the imperfections, we at least tried to do it God's way. And that gives our lives a significance. So for me, the challenge of Mary and the inspiration of Mary is that she saw her place in God's story, in God's plan. If it's all about me, and my life, and my plan, and my story, it will all end, and one will be forgotten. But God has a plan. He has a story. And you have a part in that story. Believe me. That is why it is the greatest story ever told because it is a story that draws us into itself. Our lives have significance both for now and for eternity. Only one life, and it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So friends, I invite you to consider again this, this wonderful, this amazing, this extraordinary Christmas story. It is the greatest story ever told. And it involves you, not just something we read about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son for you. That we might not live a futile existence but you'd share in the very life of God himself. Now that is a story I cannot ignore in all conscience. I cannot ignore. May God at this Christmas time press his story and enable you to understand where you fit in to that comparable story. God be with you. Amen. And so, friends, I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, the story of Jesus is a story like no other. And in these days, as we move towards Christmas and we come to Christmas Day itself, may it be a story that challenges us. May it be, Lord, a story that takes us up to another level, from the levels of mediocrity to the level of commitment and renewal of vows to you. 
Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for that trust that you had in us. Thank you that as we surrender our lives to you, you have given us a new beginning, a new start, and a new future, both for this life and the next. Lord, may your blessing be upon our families. And we ask your protection upon them as many of them travel around the countryside. We pray that they may arrive safely and that in length of days they will return home safely as well. God, have mercy also upon our land. We need you. We need you, Lord. Please have mercy upon this nation and bring us out of the darkness into the glorious light of your Son, whose birth we celebrate and declare to the world this Christmas season. Amen. We're going to sing together another great hymn. We're over to the Royal Albert Hall, in fact. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn. Well, folks, it's been great having you sharing in this online service. I hope that you will join Ken next week, Sunday, 
uh, service and also on Christmas Day when Ken and I will be sharing the service together with our wives. I'll have you know and that could be an interesting experience for them and for us all. Thank you Angie. Have a good holiday in Plettenberg Bay. And as we go, a blessing. May the joy of the angels and the eagerness of the shepherds and the perseverance of the wise men and the obedience of Joseph and Mary and the peace of the eternal Christ be yours at this Christmas time. And may the blessing of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be yours now and always. Amen. God be with you and a Merry Christmas to you all.